Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another Bulletproof for BJJ podcast. I am JT, and I'm here with my partner in crime, King of Breathing, Joey. That's right, guys. I breathe every day. Can you believe it? He's putting in the work. I sometimes breathe. I'm, I'm, I'm an anaerobic. I'm more anaerobic. Same way an atheist. Like, <laughs> I kind of, yeah. There's some credit to breathing. Guys, the Brown Belt Survival Guide. That's what it is. When you get to that level in the game, you've been in there maybe six, seven, eight years, you put in the work. You've got some great skills, but will you make it to black belt? I feel, as much as plenty of people quit at blue belt, a lot of people get retired in their brown belt. Even though it's like some honorary ground we all want to reach, once you're there, it's hard. I, I believe it's very hard for a lot of reasons. And uh, do, you, do you think it's harder than, like, do you think that there's a significant drop off there versus, say, at Purple Belt? Yes. I feel like there's still a lot of hope in the Purple Belt. <laughs> I feel like someone's got their Purple Belt, like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm over halfway, almost you know? Like, I'm almost there. Like, I'll just skip through brown, and then before you know it, I'm a black belt. Yeah. And it's like, well, actually, what I have found is that a lot of people, life situations change around brown belt. Kids, uh, maybe they've, you know, they've, They've this gone is, through an apprenticeship. Yeah, they've got their own business now. Uh, they're not training as much. Maybe they're getting away with it because they're really good, you know, but the expectation is higher. I've seen that. I've talked to other instructors like, yeah, this brown belt needs to, you know, they can't rest on their laurels. You know, brown belt can't train like they're a blue belt. It's like, well, life got a lot harder. I'm not making excuses for people, yeah. but I've seen it. And Joe, you've been there. That's right, guys. I have been a brown belt. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you're the worst you fucking idiot. You set me up. <laughs> yeah. I'm, trying, I'm trying to. That's throw right, you. guys. Anyway, I hope you got a lot out of that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> right, I'll see you next week. No. Well, let me. As somebody who was on their brown belt a long time and yep. had different wasn't levels. that long, bro. It was like fucking eight years. <laughs> <laughs> some you know, people have raised year, couple, three. Like, let's some say people have years. raised three children and got a black belt in the time of the Joe to go from brown to black. Just the story, just to recount the tale for anyone that didn't hear the episode. But I'm at a competition. I'm a brown belt. I'm at a competition that I couldn't compete in because I'd gotten injured. I was meant to be competing. It was going to be my first comp of brown belt, and I was injured, so I wasn't competing. And I ran into a guy that I've known by association, not personally, through jujitsu. And uh, he was like, hey, man, how you going? And I was like, oh, hey, bro, nice to meet you. Winston. Right. From Garage. And he was like, oh, hey, man, yeah, cool. It's, it's nice, nice to meet you. And he said, um, oh, uh, man, I remember you from back in the day when I started training. And uh, he's, he was like, you were a brown belt when I started training. And I'm like, fuck, that's going back. And I was, I was like, where are you at now? He said, I'm a black belt. Oh, <laughs> dagger in the heart. I was like. Damn, man. <laughs> that's like when you're talking to someone younger than you and, and you know, you're talking about like, I don't know, when you graduated high school and they're yeah. like, that's the year I was born. born. And you're like, shut the fuck up, idiot. <laughs> <All right. laughs> How to make someone feel old. <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, well, when, what I was, was thinking that is a relevant point to make, if you're looking at the, so I was thinking about this, if you look at the younger, newer generation of jiu-jitsu, Mm. the Michael Galvans, the Fabrizio Andres, Cola Bates and whatever. Yeah. These guys, like what, what we're describing won't be relevant to them because no, they started young and they're like, they will be, I mean, most, you know, half of those people mentioned the black belts already, but they will have gone through this whole belt journey. They're breezing through. Right by the time they're like early 20s. I think the difference is with these, with the younger generation, they started younger. So they got a lot of years in when they were like kids and teens. That's right. They got 10 years in before they were 18. Yeah, they did it while they were kids. Right, but Whereas I think what we're talking about is someone who's maybe come to jiu-jitsu in their mid to late 20s, Yeah, and you're 10 years in, you're which in your is, 30s. Which or, is kind of characteristic of our generation. Yeah, definitely. Although, I was, then I was thinking about it, I'm like, it's probably never going to change. You're always going to have people picking jiu-jitsu up at a later age. Yes. Be it mid to late 20s, early 30s, 40s, whatever, right? Of course. And But the thing is for you, Joe, the, the big thing there wasn't just, oh, I'm not doing jiu-jitsu. You started a business. You built a gym, yeah, and and trained other trainers, and like, just went into a different, went down a different path, I guess, to somebody else who maybe just had a regular day job and did jujitsu as their expression piece. Yeah, you know that that we could say that that's really what took you away from jujitsu, but maybe in some ways kept your longevity in jujitsu by you being fitter, healthier, stronger. Yeah, yeah, I think there's some truth in that. I think the the 
the main thing that happened there was that I was I was kind of over it by the time I got my brown belt. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, and the gym, I, like I wasn't digging the gym I was at. The vibe yeah. wasn't good. Coach wasn't into it. And I, um, you know, I was a purple belt. And I remember, like, I for me, it was all like, um, it was all like everything was improving right. rapidly from when I started to like when I was a purple belt. Right competing like just getting better and better all the time wasn't really you know i have whatever shit periods yeah but if i look back i'm like yeah it was just like mostly success yeah and then at a point there in my purple belt started to just plateau Mm. wasn't getting what i needed from the coach the gym vibe wasn't that great wasn't really into it but was still like fuck i i want to get my brown belt yes and um so it worked for that and then by the time i got it i remember i was Sort of a little bit at a wit's end with it all. Yes. Anyways, um, yeah, it coincided with me opening a gym. And so, you know, with a couple of mates. And so it was like, I don't have time to drive across town right now. And try. I'm, I'm just coaching all the time. Yeah. So I basically just put the belt on the shelf and was like, right, that's me. Near enough is good enough. Yeah. Like a really tough brown belt's almost a black belt, right? Like you, yeah. you meet tough brown belts, you're like, they could towel up plenty of black belts right because i think it's another thing that achieving a black belt for people for many people not all that's a huge achievement and at that point people are retiring they're like i put 10 15 years in this sucker i'm doing other things i got my black belt i i love it i love jujitsu but they're obviously not going to engage with it the same way they did when they're blue belt or a purple belt well it is very interesting once the the motivation of that next belt is gone yeah isn't it yeah. Then you're like, oh, well, what's what's motivating Where's me it now? Going yeah. Now? As much as you're not showing up every day for that, yeah. It's this kind of driving thing that's always there. That you're like, oh, I want to, I want to get to there, the next stage. Yeah. It's it is hard to see that path because this is something else I want to mention, and, and I realized this actually when I was in Taekwondo. When you're a senior belt, your coach doesn't care as much. Your coach is like, wow, well, you're you're like a you're on the way out. Yeah. Well, you're you're kind of like a, a you're not quite me, but you're pretty close you're good you know you'll work it out like you know the coach is like really putting time and attention on oh that up and coming white belt or that blue belt next world champion or yep. you know th- the next new hot kid on the block kind of thing it's like well you you don't become furniture but you, like being an eldest child in a family it's like well you can brush your own teeth you can put your own shoes on now yeah we've got to worry about the baby you know you're not you're not the only child anymore. I'm 35. I can't brush my teeth. Please help me. Don't make me do that, mum. <laughs> Please cut the the, the crust right. off my sandwiches. Yeah. Gross, mum. God, I don't want hairs on my chest. Um, but it's one of those funny things that actually when you hit that point, you need direction. It's like to to cross that line from brown belt to chasm belt, it's hard. Yeah. It's really hard. And what I've noticed or what I've seen is, is two major things. The brown belt who's kind of semi-retired who's good enough to kick everyone's ass, but is maybe like a bit out of shape, not that fit, but just on pure skill can just kind of towel everyone. Yeah. Except for the black belts. Like and he's got a few, couple really hard rounds in him. Yeah. And then, nah, sit yeah. off to the side and you're like... Very faded belt often. Yeah, just tattered, just had a, a whole colony of moths yeah. working on it. Often doesn't make eye contact when you approach them to roll. No, they, no. They're just like... No, they just well, engage in the role without any kind of like personal yeah. recognition. Don't really care about who you are. Yep. Obviously, you're not on my radar because you're not on my level. But then I think that's kind of almost like lazy man brown belt. Then you get the, the mat enforcer brown belt. They're there. They want the black belt. They're tough. And typically younger. Younger. Yeah, but like staunch. Yeah, I'm, staunch proof, I'm, I'm showing everyone I'm a black belt. I'm a black belt. You yeah. better know it. That I'm wearing a brown belt, but I'm a black belt. And the coach can rely on that person. <laughs> That's the pit bull. Yeah. Oh, we've got this MMA fighter come in who's wearing a white belt. So the, Tom Hardy has come in wearing a blue belt. <laughs> bash Tom Hardy. I don't care if you like Venom, bash him. <laughs> Eat his face. If you like Venom, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just put that out there. That Big fan of Tom. Yeah, Tom Hardy. Congrats great. on winning that competition. Venom <laughs> suck balls. At, at blue belt. Yeah. <laughs> Foot locking a guy, whatever. Good luck to you. No, that was fucking dope. No, whatever. Yeah. Like, no, I I, I, I'm a big fan of Tom Hardy. I, I, I love uh, Bane in uh, the Batman series. But whatever. Like, I think ultimately, this there's a lot of weight that comes with a brown belt. There's an expectation you look after yourself, and also we need you for stuff. We need you to help coach, or we need you to this. But you don't get the kudos of a black belt. It's true. You just don't get the same. That's right. Like, if the funny thing is, 
people who are not jujitsu people go, oh, what belt are you? Are you a black belt yet? You're like, are you a fucking doctor yet? Yeah. Like, what did you, did you even do a master's? Just shut the fuck up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like brown, like, brown. That's kind of a shit color, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. it kind of is. It's not really a black belt. <laughs> you know, and, and people have no idea what a brown belt is. And, and I think the hardest thing is you put all this time and energy in, you accumulate all these injuries. You're so close, but you could stop there, right? Easily. There's, there seems to me like a, like an inverse kind of timelines of, like say for the person who's picking it up at a, at a, at a mature age. So sure. let's say mid, mid to late twenties. Yeah. And you, it's, it's the same thing with wisdom in life as I am coming to understand, I believe. Mm. I hear other people talk about, but it's like you're on this journey and as you are starting to learn more about it and more about yourself and acquire more skills and become you know, you say your, your, your perspective broadens, you also have less time and less ability to, and less youth on your side oh, yeah. to be able to fully express these learnings. Yeah. And it's like, and then you reach this pinnacle of like black belt and it's like, great. Now you've got a fuckload of injuries, no time and a family to look after, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or something like that. Yeah. And you're like, man, if only I knew this shit when I was 20. I mean, people say it about like wisdom, right? Where it's like, sure. I wish I knew this stuff as a younger person. Yeah. And yeah. There's, there's a great French saying, I, I actually got this from a rapper who just quotes this as a little intro to a song they made. And it's called, it's, the French saying is, if only the young could know and if only the old could do. Right. And I, I feel like if we look at uh, belts as a timeline, let's say black belt is before you're retired. Like let's say black belt's 50 years old. If we just, this is a crude analogy, my friends. Let's say blue belt is like a teenager. Purple belt's like 20s, 30s. Brown belt's kind of 40s. But like if you don't look after yourself in your 20s and 30s, 40s going to look like shit. Yeah, like you're going to be, tough. yeah, we all know that person, right? You look at them, like maybe you grew up with them, you see him, you're like, is that John? You're like, oh, John went, <laughs> John went too hard. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, hey, John, how's it going? Bro, do you want to come to a rave on Saturday? <laughs> like, Don't you have three kids? Oh, yeah, but uh, my, <laughs> my ex-missus takes them, like, it's sweet. They're like, dude, <laughs> fucking grow up. Like, this is the hard thing, guys. And I um, don't want you to misconstrue this because I have a lot of empathy. I got my most injuries in my blue belt. You don't have empathy, bro. I have empathy. Let's just clarify one fucking Let, thing. Let's pretend I have empathy, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> look, if you're out there and you're a brown belt and you haven't looked after your body, go fuck yourself. I mean, look, there's <laughs> things we can do. And this is what I wanted to say. It's actually more important. It's like when people say, oh, I'm old and I'm fucked now and who cares? No, you've got to take responsibility for it because it matters more. Mm. Like you, you looking after your body, you making the most of those small moments you get to do jiu-jitsu. You want it to be beautiful. You don't want it to be like, oh, I tape my wrist. I tape my neck. I tape my ankle. You spend half an hour taping to get in two rolls and then you go home. Yeah, that's not what I want for anyone. Because my foot like a few white belts. Yeah, peace just, out. Yeah, just <laughs> just heel hock the new the, the good child class guy. <laughs> <laughs> Beat up all the lightweight people. Yeah. No, it, it, it's because we had a guy Rafe. Now, I don't know if you're hearing this. Rafe, Rafe had like a receding hair, like d black rock star hair mullet, but receding hair, fat, never washed his gi. Stinky guy, kind of fat. Where was this at? This is at Peter Debean yep. way back in the day. He was yep. a brown belt. He was a three or four stripe brown belt for as long as I ever knew him. I never saw him get his black belt. Right on. No fitness, no diet, stank. Yeah. Towed everybody. But he would tap you really fast. He'd tap you, break your spirit, and then cruise. Yeah. He did that to everybody because he just had no fitness. He wouldn't fight hard. He'd fight hard for the first minute, get a tap, and then... Just pace himself. Yeah. You'd only ever do three or four rolls. It's that wisdom coming through. <laughs> Maybe. But I, I, I think the thing which he was never, he never considered himself an athlete. He competed a bit when he was younger, but he was like, nah, that's for sports people. And I'm, I'm a martial artist. Right, yeah. This is me. But really, he was just lazy. And then I've seen people who were the opposite of that, who are super hardworking, super disciplined, really determined to get their black belt. But I think the difference there was he was like, if I never get my black belt, I never get my black belt. He'd kind of made that decision in himself and he wasn't going to push any harder. Whereas I've seen people who are probably maybe a little bit more hopeful or maybe they had a better relationship with their coach or whatever it was, that they were like, there's a path to black belt and I'm going to get there. Yeah. 
Do you, would you say that, that makes a difference? Like, what was the difference for you? The difference for me was, well, so if going off that, like when I, you know, gave it away, the difference was then meeting a coach, Adam Childs, right. who reignited my spirit for jiu-jitsu. Cool. You know, and I was, I, you know, the gym was open and operating and we'd, fuck, we'd done a lot by then. Many years had passed, but I was in a position where I was like, actually, I want to get back into jits. Mm. And I think I'd had about a year prior to that of like training at a local gym that just, you know, I just, I wasn't learning anything. Yeah. And I was like, oh, fuck, this guy can teach me some stuff. Yeah. And I could actually get back into it. And it just came at the right time, mm. you know, and, and he had those expectations of me where it was like, you were going to get your black belt. You yeah. know, and so I'm like, oh shit, okay, like, you know, we openly had that conversation. Yeah. And so I'm like, all right. Whereas if he hadn't have mentioned it, potentially I would have just, if he hadn't have mentioned it and if he hadn't have sort of kept me accountable Guided with my training, yeah. yeah, I probably would just still have kept, you know, smashing white belts and <laughs> never have really progressed. Right. You know? So you think the coach piece is pretty important. Then. That was very important for me. Absolutely. So yeah. do you feel that other brown belts might be a bit in the wilderness? Like maybe they maybe don't have the love from the coach anymore? Or? I guess it's definitely a factor, right? Yeah. You, you know this, like like even with the, you know, with the gym, like when you're, say when I'm coaching a class yeah. of, of, you know, gym stuff, um, I tend to give less attention to the more advanced lifters or they whatever. Can, they're autonomous. Yeah, they know what they're doing. They've done yeah. it a million times. They don't and, need you it. Know, yeah, but the reality is that they kind of need it just as much as everybody else. Everyone needs it. Yeah, and that's and maybe it's maybe they don't need so much right now in this moment, but they need more like context or guidance on the on the longer view. Yeah. Order. Hey, man, over the next six months or end of next year, I want you to be going for your black belt, and this is what I need to see. That kind of chat. Yeah. So I do think, yeah, for a, like if you look at what it would be, what it's like. I say what it would be like because I don't run a jiu-jitsu academy. But you've got a fuckload of things to keep your finger on the pulse, like as the owner, head coach. Definitely. It makes sense that, you know, you're going to be so concerned about new members and all that, mm. selling geese at inflated prices. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, <laughs> that you will be maybe like sacrificing a little bit of the needs of the high belt. Definitely. Um, so, yeah, this definitely seems symptomatic. And I think it gets harder. I feel like brown belt... If you're going to compete, if you're going to be a competitor, some of the best fights I've ever seen is brown belt at Worlds. Yeah. Because you've got someone who's been on their brown belt four or five years and their coach is just keeping them there. Yeah. And they just want their fucking black belt. Yeah. And then you've got someone who's just got their brown belt showing up. And that's a stark difference. You've got someone who's really honed their skills, like leg lock games tight. They're ultra competitive. They're tapping black belts. And then you've just got a new brown belt who's like, well, I'll give it a crack. You're like, oh, yeah, that's rough. So I think it can be really tough territory to walk into because you've got people who are real killers. And then some people who are like, I'm just, just getting over the line here. I remember having a conversation with um, Carlos Valente. Okay, yeah, yeah. Do you know him? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I've met the, him before. the big guy? Yeah. And I, I, funny turn of events, but I'm, I'm having some drinks at a bar in San Diego with him and a, and a couple of friends. Oh, cool. And uh, as you do, yeah, right, of course, yeah, everyone's been to San Diego, right? Of course, hanging out with them. But he was like, he was telling me about one of his best students, and it was, it was uh, Tiago Ferreira, oh, okay, from here in used to be here in Sydney, Shark oh, Jiu Jitsu. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. And he was like, he was, and I'm, I'm sh yeah, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's who he was. And I'm like, yeah, I know that guy. He's like, yeah, yeah. He said he used to train with me back when he was a brown belt, and he said he was the most dangerous guy on the mats, and he's like. Anyone that would come in, I would make them roll with Tiago. Oh. And he's like, you always got to watch out for the brown belts because they're trying to prove they're a black belt. They are. And yes. I was like, fuck, it's a really good point. I think I was a blue belt at the time. Actually, yeah. wait. Yeah, no, I was. I was training. Maybe I was purple. But uh, yeah, just insightful because it's true. It is true. Black belts, depending. But I know mm. definitely for me, I got nothing to prove now. Yes. Like I want to train and stuff, but I'm like, I'm not trying to flex in any way. No, fair enough. Whereas you know, catch me like a couple of years back and I'm trying to show a coach, hey, yeah. grab me up, bro. Yeah, put me in the game, put me in the black belt game. What's the other part of it's the injury thing, right? The injury thing, guys, and it hurts me because even now looking at our kind of, our, our friends running gyms, guys we came up with, guys we competed with, our cohort, our generation of black belts, a lot of them are carrying serious injuries. Like yeah. they're still working hard and maybe they're doing some token rehab because- uh, you know they have, they have yeah. to yeah i did the exercises shout out sammy backy once <laughs> right. for the neck it didn't Look, work I can, I can tuck my chin yeah 
No, <laughs> no, it's all right. I had a chat with Sammy the other day. He, he's, he's doing some. But what I want to say relevant to this is it breaks my heart because these are people who I respect. I know what they were like when they were at their most savage as competitors. And now I see them and they are struggling to express their jiu-jitsu because of their injuries, the injuries they've eaten yeah. over time. And it just happens. Injury happens in jiu-jitsu. But what I'm seeing now is people are going harder sooner and they're getting there at brown belt. You and know what? They're, they're getting that injured, real serious fucked upness at brown. Oh, right. You know, people are going poor harder at blue. Yeah. Whereas that, it's definitely gotten a lot earlier, hasn't earlier. it? Where people are fucking going. And super they're younger. Hand. So yep. you're getting people in their mid twenties who are kind of kind of semi crippled, yeah, because they're trying to be the Meow Brothers or they're trying to be whoever the next hardest working person is, yeah, with no concept that this is actually it's shortening up their athletic potential and in long term it could you know really lead to being disabled. So I guess what I would say to anyone if you're a hard working purple about to get your brown or if you're someone who's been on their brown belt you suffered a major injury. The body maintenance thing, I feel, is the single most important thing you can do at brown belt to ensure you get your black belt. Not rolling more, not competing more, none of that. Because if you don't sort that out, you will retire. You will. And I've seen it. Yeah. Like it's, you might, maybe you just scrape out the black belt, but then you won't do anything meaningful with it. So what's the point of that? Yeah. And I, I mean, I, 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 I agree wholeheartedly. The, I think the other side of the injury thing, like – moving up not necessarily like the the big catastrophic injuries which are of course a factor mm. um but it's just the accumulation of damage yeah and and I, something that i've learned from years and years of coaching people and you would have had this same observation that people will like we accumulate damage just living our lives and you don't notice it when you're in your 20s or your early 30s because you just haven't lived that much life yes and then by the time you get to like mid 30s you're like holy oh man like i got this fucking lower back Still thing that's always kicking that. off on my shoulder mm. and if you look it's if you look at it it's not like you did something recently to your shoulder no it's the fact that you've been using or not using your body in a particular way mm. for the last 37 years and yes. now it's rearing its head yeah and uh, this like it's really like you can't pinpoint an event for these yeah. kinds of things um and that sort of damage is is what i think takes people out of all sports like yeah. you know on mass it's like oh fuck i just can't handle anymore and just pull up so sore after soccer or fucking yeah. boxing or whatever it is um so like you said having that a little bit of body maintenance, something that you do a couple times a week, a few times a week, it allows you just to like balance this shit out and not become a victim to that sort of accumulation. You are going to accumulate damage. There's no way uh, no to question. escape that. But you can definitely mitigate how serious the effects of it are. And then the emotional damage of having a lower belt catch you. <laughs> you don't want to be still hasn't slipping. happened to me i don't know what that's like no i, I, I had it one time all the fucking time no 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 but i'm saying don't like, tell no there was a very <laughs> there was a very distinct point that i hadn't trained for a couple of weeks i went in and i got choked out as a four stripe brown belt i like very close to my black belt by a what i buy a four stripe white belt Oof. the best white belt in the gym <laughs> but i just didn't i didn't respect him yeah all right he's a what a like a Adam Liverly, if you're listening, like credit to you for catching it. <laughs> but Don't forget you, motherfucker. No, no, no. But here's, I'll, I'll, I'll just quickly tell this story. It was like, he's Wait, trying don't, to don't hype him up now just because he caught you. No, cross, cross choke, I'm trying to pass. He put, he put me out. But here's the funny thing. You know how people might be concerned for your well-being? People are like, oh, are you okay? That was not the response I got. <laughs> like I like, kind of came to and I was like, well, what happened? He's like, I choked you out. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And there's like 30 seconds left around. He's like, you should probably stop. I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. Cool. Like, I didn't care. Actually, I actually had a little bit of brain death. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah whatever, man. Cool, cool, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went over to the side and people were like, bro, are you okay? You just got caught by a white belt. You're a fucking brown belt. What the fuck is wrong with you? People like, said that? I had three or four people be like, JC, what the fuck is wrong with you, mate? Like, you've fallen off. And I was like, I was like, wow, I'm... I don't mind, you know. Fuck you guys. Check this out. Check out this next five minutes. No, I was just like, oh, jujitsu. You know, I was like actually really like elated from the brain death. <laughs> like I'd been choked out pretty hard. But then after class, class is done. Time is off. People are leaving the mat. He comes up and goes, hey, bro, you want to roll again? 
No. Nah. And I was like, the audacity on this motherfucker. I'm like, you think that's gonna happen? You think that's gonna happen again? Like I was like, are you sure? Because there's no timer, there's no witnesses. We can do this. Like I'm, I don't mind. <laughs> like the respect level's gone up, bro. Like I respect you. You caught me, but you're never gonna get that chance again. And he's like, yeah. Like he was really like, I'll get you again. <laughs> yeah. I, I beat him down for like, I don't know, eight or 10 minutes. And then it was just like a verbal <laughs> tap. I didn't even submit him. I just, I physically just bashed him. There's no one there. I didn't care. I'm like, this is getting as rough as it gets within the rules, homie. And uh, he gave up. He's like, enough, enough. And I'm like, this is a tap. He's like, oh, I'm sick of this. And I'm like, all right, all right, cool. Mind you, he got his blue belt like the next week. Like he, he, tr he trashed all the white belts, all the blue belts. He got his belt on a blue belt challenge. Like he beat all the blue belts. He's very good. But never, ever again. I heard he was all right. I didn't hear he was very good. <laughs> he was sub-average. <laughs> <laughs> Let's spend 10 minutes hyping up the guy that caught JT. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's, it's funny because it was a shock to the system because I Always just, is. I didn't respect him. Yeah. Because I'm like, ah, you know, this guy, he's strong, but he's not that good. Yeah. Totally caught me. I was slipping. And it was true. My standard had slipped and he got me. But never again. But that's all, I mean, you know, even that, right? Like we were talking about this competitive nature in jiu-jitsu and stuff earlier today. It's, um, you know, the, like also where does it say that like now that you're at this belt, you can never be tapped by anyone no, that's lower course. than you in training. But we do all have this kind of inherent sort yeah. of thing where it's like never get tapped by someone lower than you. Yeah, what's your standard? Right, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, which I, you know, personally and kind of speaking a little bit to that episode we posted last week or whatever, yeah. that, that it kind of like that's something that I'm trying to like just kind of, um, let go of yeah exactly because it, it does get in the way you know for me in parts um but yeah the brown belt thing is it's interesting right i think it's it's it can be a tight like just thinking back to to what it was like and for folks who might be there with the saying survival guard it's like um sometimes yeah your body isn't giving you the response that you want and things mm -hmm. aren't working quite there and the things that you used to do that worked for you at might. blue and purple belt might not be working mm -hmm. anymore. You change it up. And that's a real harsh reality to face yep. because you're like, oh, fuck, if I can just hold the line, we're going to get to black. But sometimes like, no, you got to let go of this line and you got to build a new one. Take a new one. Yeah. And I, for me, that happened when I injured my knee, mm. the ACL, that my guard just disintegrated. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, my X guard was my thing. Yes. And it's coming back, but it's like, I had to find a new way to play jujitsu. Yeah. And that like, pushed me back in terms of where I felt in the pecking order because I just wasn't that good for a bit. Right. Um, and it was like, damn, this sucks, mm. you know, but that's the reality of it. Yeah. The injury thing definitely for me made me question whether I wanted to continue or not. Yeah. You know, you're like, oh, is it worth it? Do I really want it that bad? Yeah, because if you can't even do the thing you love, which is jujitsu, which is what everybody comes back to, if you can't enjoy it and roll and, and, and do it without immense levels of pain, what am I doing this for? Like, why am I in this if I can't enjoy it the way I want? Yeah. Which is hard. And I think my game changed at Brown Belt because I was switched to more of a top game player because I knew that I wasn't going to bulge discs passing guard. You know, like I, I wasn't going to get hip injuries staying on top and doing takedowns. Yeah. There's other problems, but yeah, I definitely switched my game from like Purple Belt as like a really hard guard player. Brown Belt, once I got my Brown Belt, judo, wrestling, staying on top, pressure, top game. Yeah, right. And, 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 and subsequently have had significantly less injuries. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's made a big difference to change the game. But uh, anyway, shout out to all you brown belts out there fighting the good fight. Stay in the game. It's worth it, but it's, you've got to change it up. Yeah, it's, it's a thing. And I guess like kind of the way we're framing this chat, it might be relevant to someone at a different belt, of course. You might be facing these same at kind of... Or exactly, these challenges at any point. Um, yeah, I think on that like idea of like trying to keep your same game even though you know it's no longer working for you i think that like resisting the knowing that you need to change and fighting against that yeah. that can often just like retire you because yes. you're like you're not enjoying training you're not having success with it you're not getting better it's painful like it's it's just shit and so just because like i mean just i'm just not enjoying it anymore mm. whereas if you can recognize anger all right what's what's good for me now like what part of my old game am i trying to keep that's not working for me uh, it's because i'm trying to use my fucking athleticism that worked for me 10 years ago yeah okay let's address that and once you address it you're like fuck you have this little uptick, uptick. in 
development and then training becomes a more positive experience enjoyable that's right and then it's like oh shit i actually enjoy this thing again yeah the enjoyment piece is so key and i think we we do forget that but um we got some messages joe we got a we got a voicemail we got a voicemail here we go here we go speak hello guys my question for you is nose or maybe mode breathing in long-term performance on the mat as a reference, I'd like to recommend you Patrick McCohen book, Oxygen Advantage. I'm curious of your opinion and hope for a podcast on this subject. Thanks. Sebastian, what a legend. Thanks cool. for the question, man. Sure. So just to clarify, Sebastian was saying, uh, wasn't actually a very specific question, but he's like nose or mouth breathing for long-term training. Mm. Uh, and he referenced the Patrick McCohen book, Oxygen Advantage. Yep. Um, and you have read this book. John. I've read it, yeah. And you talked about it. Yeah, yeah, we did an episode on it. Um, great book. Fucking yeah. awesome. I highly recommend it for anyone listening. Oxygen Advantage, get your hands on it. Um, I guess, you know, neither of us are authorities on the breathing piece. Not at all. But certainly what I learned from that book is that being able to maintain nasal breathing while training is optimal for performance. Yeah. And it's optimal for a bunch of reasons. Um it's really hard when you're not used to it. Mm. And so it seems almost impossible when you just, if you just take that and you're like, all right, tonight at training, I'm not going to breathe through my mouth. You feel like you get, like you'll, you'll probably die <laughs> yeah. if you actually just don't <laughs> you, breathe through your mouth. You'll choke yourself out. Yeah. But so what it is then and what it presents in the book is like simple kind of protocols that you can use to train your breathing, to get yourself into a position where you can maintain nasal breathing for the most part of your training. Maybe do you, not the really... Do you really think it's legit? It, like, so... I, sorry, let me cut in for one second. Mm. I think if you're jogging or you're cycling or you can do... Like, if you're doing something that's steady state where you can kind of control the resistance or the tempo, I believe that you... It's possible to do that. But if you have someone smother choking you, <laughs> like, you don't have a choice. You're trying to breathe out your fucking ear hole. Yeah. Like... You don't have a choice if someone's like, yeah, you know, like yeah. there's so much to overcome with jujitsu. Do you actually think it it's possible to roll and keep that presence of mind, or even if you wear something like tape over your mouth? Like, do you think it's possible? Well, realistically, for the, the question, day? do I think it's possible to improve it? Absolutely. Oh, no, Is no. it possible to never breathe through your mouth? No, 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 no. But yeah. I'm saying in jujitsu, I just think it's. I don't think that's legit. I think it's impossible. I think it's definitely possible to improve it. And so, like, because the whole the whole basis of the the training is improving your tolerance to CO two. Sure. So if you think about when you're training jits, like, say you go and you're like, all right, I'm just going to start breathing through the nose, and you're just doing that. There will come a point, whether it's like scrambling or someone smothering you, where you're going to have to start breathing through your mouth. Mm. What triggers that change is a buildup of CO two in your blood. And your body goes, I need to get rid of this CO2. I've hit my threshold with it. And so you start breathing through the mouth because it gets rid of the CO2. Yeah. The training, the breath training, uh, builds a stronger tolerance. So all it means is that your threshold for when that point comes where you've got to start sucking in the big ones through the mouth is higher. The question was about jujitsu on the mat. Could you do it doing, during jujitsu? Well, I, I don't think there's an absolute in terms of you can never like you will never i just think it's like can you can like i think he's like what's your thoughts on it uh my thoughts are that everyone could benefit sure from learning how to breathe better through the nose because an improved like an increased tolerance to co2 means essentially better performance yes you know and i know that for myself i can feel it sometimes i'm like sucking in big ones through the mouth yeah and sometimes in those moments you can go hang on stop breathing through the mouth Into and then the as nose. soon as you start breathing you it calms you and you're yeah. like, fuck, now I'm more mindful, more aware. Yeah, my, my old Taekwondo coach, Jeff Crane, used to make me do that. And he was an elite level boxer before he did that. In, in between rounds, when he would get me in the corner and chat to me, he'd go, he'd just go straight away, in through the nose, out through the mouth. And he would just, he would just bring my attention to that. He'd make me do three breaths before he gave me any coaching. And just by doing that, it just slowed everything down and very beneficial. I just, I can't imagine being able to, like, unless you're, like, kicking someone's butt and you're like, oh, this is pretty easy. Yeah. Mmm, nasal breathing. Yeah. <laughs> but no, if you're getting your ass kicked and squat and runs fucking chest pressuring you, <laughs> take a little breath through the mouth every now and again. 
if, if possible. Yeah, if just not- don't let us see because that's not ideal. No, not at all. Yeah, no, good thing to train. Um, we'll do a podcast on it when we can get someone who can who can be more of an authority on it, I think. That yeah. would be cool. Um, so there you go. If you're a bit of an authority on it, get in touch. Let's talk. Cool. Thanks, fam. Hey, guys, if you need help with your training, we got you. Uh, you can sign up for our program where you've got access to multiple programs. Mm-hmm. You can do your first week for free, uh, and if you don't like it, just cancel, but you're going to love it, so stick around. Go to bulletproofforbjj.com. And use the code BJJ Podcast, you'll get 20% off. We'll see you on the inside. You. See you guys.